All right, so. All right, uh, so our um, next talk is constant round blind classical verification of quantum sampling. Uh, this is work by Kaiman Chang, uh, Yi Li, uh, Han Xuan uh, Lin, and Xiaodu uh, Wu. Uh, and uh, Yi Li will, uh, will give the talk. Uh, test mic, okay, it works, amazing. Okay, good morning everyone. So, let's get started. So, okay, so the first thing, oh, this is a pointer, this is amazing. Ah, okay, cool. So, sorry, it's my first time giving an in-person talk. Anyways, let, let's actually get started. Okay, so motivations. So let me talk a bit about what this work is about, what problem we are trying to solve. So today, let's say you want to run some quantum computations, but well, you don't have a quantum computer. So what people usually do these days is to just, you know, send your program and your, I probably can do this. Yeah, to send your program and your input to a quantum cloud server somewhere. And then the cloud server will do the, will do the computation for you. And then the cloud server will send the, send you the output back. If my latest point hurt, oh, here. Yes, sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, so as a crypto researchers, I mean, this seems good, right? Except as crypto researchers, of course, we see a couple of things wrong with this picture. So the first issue is, of course, that now you are suddenly sending all of your input data to a cloud server, and who knows what the server is going to be doing with, with your data. So the first thing that you want to, the first issue is that we want this to be a private input. In other case, we want the blindness property where the server learns nothing. That is the uh, first thing we want. But then there's also a second issue, which is what we call verifiability, which is that we do not know, we want to know if the server is doing this computation correctly or if he's just doing some strange stuff and sending us some nonsense that's not correct. And of course, we are not the first one who asked this uh, question about verifiability. In fact, uh, more than 15 years ago, it was asked by Gossisman, so can a classical computer verify the result of a quantum computation through interaction? So there's been, of course, been a lot of research since then, and a lot of earlier works just solve, solve this problem under some easier settings. So for example, they might allow the client to have some quantum capabilities, or they might allow the use of the, many different servers where the client can ask each different server and check, and check if the result is consistent. But then the big breakthrough came uh, only four years ago by Mahadev. So this work she constructed, she answered this question in the setting assist. So only uh, one fully classical client and only one quantum server. And the answer she gives is yes for decision problems. Okay, so now, of course, we want to ask, well, is that the end of the story? Well, let me uh, remind you what decision problems are. So decision problems is saying that, okay, you have a BQP language here, and you have a instance X, and you want to find whether it's a yes instance or no instance. So in other words, this thing has a deterministic correct answer. So, of course, then the natural next question to ask is what if the, what if, what about randomized outputs? So, and of course, a lot of quantum algorithms that uh, people are starting today actually do have randomized outputs. For example, we have uh, quantum mechanical simulations and quantum supremacy experiments from a couple years ago, you know, the random circuit, and also uh, a lot of uh, quantum machine learning and optimization algorithms, all of this has uh, randomized outputs, in which case you cannot just, uh, it's decision problems would not be a good model for these algorithms. So we propose to consider the uh, classical verification of quantum sampling problems. So now let me actually talk a bit about our model. So classical verification of quantum sampling. So this is a model that is uh, generalized uh, from previous model. It's a fairly natural generalization. So what happens here is that we, this is a two-party protocol between the classical client, which is always honest, and the quantum server, which could be malicious. And the classical client has a quantum circuit C and is, a, and is corresponding input. And this quantum circuit C can be any arbitrary quantum circuit 
uh, specifically, it can have randomized output. The only restriction is that the output of this circuit has to be classical. Otherwise, the client is classical. He would not be able to understand quantum outputs. OK, so and then the uh, next step is uh, just how it always goes. The two parties run some protocol and exchange some classical messages. And at the end, the verifier chooses to accept or reject. But furthermore, uh, the verifier, if a verifier accepts, then he also outputs Y, which is supposedly the output of the uh, C of X, the, uh, the computation. So here, let's actually talk a bit about security properties here, security definitions. So for completeness, uh, the first step is clear that we want the, uh, we, we want it so if the prover is, is honest, then he always gets accepted or has high probability of getting accepted. But the, uh, we actually, there's actually some, uh, some technical details here because this, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this circuit could have randomized outputs. So we are actually treating this, the computation of C of, C of X as a distribution. Uh, so we are considering the distribution of possible outputs and we want Y, we want the output of our protocol to follow the same distribution as if C of X is computed honestly. And for soundness, it is also a bit tricky, but uh, it uh, follows from the uh, from similar things. Okay, so for soundness, for all inverse polynomial errors, so here we do not have negligible errors for reasons I will also explain a bit more later, but for all inverse polynomial errors, where this n is just the size of verifier's input, so for all inverse polynomial errors, condition on the fact that if the prover has any noticeable, has this noticeable chance of getting accepted, then condition on this uh, verifier being accepted, the output is epsilon close to the actual uh, to the actual ideal target correct output distribution. So this epsilon close is, as I say, as distributions, and you can uh, you can either define uh, you can either consider this a uh, statistical distance or just computationally indistinguishable. Uh, both definitions make sense, but in our work, we only achieve computationally indistinguishable. Okay, so the so that is our model and security definition. So next, let me talk a bit about the challenges of uh, challenges involved when we try to construct a protocol under this model. So challenge of sampling problems, and this is this is question is especially worth asking because the uh, like okay. So why is this thing more why is this thing more difficult than decision problems? And this is especially worth asking because in the classical setting, there is no difference. But, in, uh, but the issue here is that a typical trick that is used in the classical setting does not work in quantum setting. So the non-classical, uh, it just doesn't generalize very well. So let me actually show you what is this. Okay, so classically speaking, let's say you have a, what? That is unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> uh, Okay, so classically speaking, let's say you have a function f, which is just a classical circuit or classical function, then of course we can just treat the, uh, we can just write the randomness out explicitly, in which case the function f would become deterministic, then you can treat every output bit as a decision problem. So you can just run, the, run your decision problem protocol and, your, and it's done. But the issue is that this does not work under a quantum setting because you know, quantum programs, they do not take an explicit random tape, but in a quantum program, your randomness comes from measuring quantum states. So it's more inherently random, and there's no way to de-randomize it, or at least it's unclear how to de-randomize a quantum program. So that's issue number one. And issue number two is a bit more technical, but it's just a recurring problem, and it's also a reason why we only achieve inverse poly error, so I want to bring this up, is the, uh, the fact that amplification does not work. So let me show you what I mean by amplification. So if you have decision problems, then of course you have yes and no instances, and this is all standard, def standard definition, that a yes instance has high probability of getting accepted, and no instance, of course, low probability, but then it's, Again, it's just a standard textbook definition that these two numbers are arbitrary 
because by repeating by replacing a protocol, you can get that thing arbitrarily close to one and this thing, this one third arbitrarily close to zero. But here's a question. What if you have a sampling problem in self-decision? So let's say if you have a sampling problem and you have a protocol with soundness error one third, it is unclear how would you run the protocol repeatedly in black box as a black box and reduce the error to epsilon. And it's just unclear how to do that. So these are the uh, two main challenges. So now let me actually tell you our main contribution, our main theorem statement. So basically under the QLW assumption, uh, I know that I'm not sure why I'm in this information theoretic section because it's clearly not information theoretic, but uh, <laughs> yes. So under the uh, learning with error, under this assumption that learning with error problem is hard for quantum computers, we construct a classical verification of quantum sampling quantum sampling protocol that is blind, so the prover learns nothing in this for message, so it's constant round, and it is we have negligible completeness errors, and we have a uh, computationally soundness, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it means the output of our protocol is computationally indistinguishable from the true, uh, from the correct uh, distribution. Okay, so before I go to the uh, technical overviews, let me just also uh, give just a bit of, uh, introduce a bit of relevant literature to put our result in, in context. So this, this table is, uh, this table is on classical verification of quantum computing. So here we restrict ourselves to the uh, settings where, the, where we just have one classical client, fully classical, and we have just one quantum server. So we start by looking at the Mahadev's protocol. So Mahadev's protocol, it is constant round, uh, it has constant error, constant soundness error, and it's for decision problems. And then after that, there are these two follow-up works, both for decision problems. So the first one is by Georges and Vidic. They are able to achieve blindness. But then they also have the, uh, they have negligible errors, but unfortunately they take polynomially many rounds, so they are not constant round. And then after that, uh, there are also these two, these two works, these two concurrent works, which achieve constant round. Okay, so, and then after that, there is our work that I mentioned earlier. So we, we are the first one that talks about sampling problems for uh, classical verification of quantum sampling. And unfortunately, we only achieve one over, only, uh, one over poly error. And we have both uh, constant round and blindness. And then after our work, there's this follow-up work that actually uses, uh, actually builds on top of our constructions. So this work studies, uh, this work setting is actually, is actually under the multi-party computation setting, but we can restrict their work to the, specialize their work to the two-party, uh, to a two-party setting with one classical party and one quantum party, in which, in which case we can compare it with our, with this setting. And if we do that, then we get this, where pseudo-deterministic is a bit more general than decision problems, but, uh, but it's less general than sampling problems. But on the other hand, the, uh, the blindness uh, definition is stronger than ours, is malicious blindness, which I will not get into right now. Okay, so now let me actually give a bit of technical overview on how, sorry, timer, okay, I'm doing good. Okay, so let's give a bit of technical overview on how do we construct our protocol. Okay, so let's actually first look at Mahadev's because our work build uh, use, uses constructions from her protocol. Okay, so the uh, Mahadev's work in turn builds on this other protocol by by the uh, Molimai and Fitzsimmons. So this protocol is also a two-party protocol, similar to the setting we had before, but the difference is, as you may see, the verifier is quantum here. So you have a quantum verifier and a quantum client. And this protocol is a single message protocol. So the prover just sends a quantum state, sends a bunch of qubits to a verifier, and the verifier would just measure each of them under either the X or Z basis. And then, uh, and, and this is a protocol for BQP, for decision problems. And what Mahadev does, Mahadev's main technical contributions can be seen as a protocol compiler, going from this 
existing protocol to, to another protocol, which where the client is now fully classical. So the goal of this, as the, as the name, XD measurement protocol may imply. So what this, what her construction allows you to do is that it allows the prover to keep the uh, NQP state. So instead of sending the state to the verifier, he just keeps it. And the verifier knows what basis does he want to measure the state. Ah, Yonda? Hmm? Yonda? Yeah, hi. Wow. English. Is it English? I don't recognize. Uh, hmm? Okay, okay. Cool. So let's... Uh... <laughs> Who are we? <laughs> okay, so the uh, instead of the prover sending client the state, the prover is keeping it as a as an input, and the client uh, also just knows what basis he wants to measure it in, and then the two parties exchange four message. So it's a four message protocol exchange four classical messages, and at the end, uh, the verifier could get a measurement result of the uh, of the state under his chosen basis. But there's a caveat here, is that this protocol, in this uh, measurement, in this protocol, the verifier gets his outcome only half of the time. So let's, uh, let me talk about uh, just a bit more detail. So, so uh, yeah. So you, you know what I mean by the verifier gets output only half of the time. So in this third message, the verifier chooses between two possible challenges, uh, T or H. T we call it testing, H we call it Hadamard, but I'm not gonna go into the actual uh, details on those naming conventions for now. But the, uh, the idea here is that this tool is chosen uniformly randomly by flipping, flipping a fair coin. And when the challenge is Hadamard, then everything works as is expected. That, uh, that the verifier will get both the flag, so either a step or reject, and a measurement outcome, and the guarantee basically everything works out. That if the flag is, is accept, then M is close to some, uh, close to the measurement result of the, uh, of the prover state. But then the, the, uh, the issue here is testing round. So on testing round, the verifier still gets to either accept or reject, but he does not get a measurement outcome. And this is, of course, uh, actually this is not an issue for BQP because under a BQP setting, you, the verifier could accept the prover anyways. He would just uh, suffer from one half soundness loss because now he gets lied to half of the time where that state is not, it's just some garbage state. Okay, but then uh, what about sampling is the question. Because while this is okay for BQP, for decision problems, suddenly for sampling is not good because now we, get, we don't even get measurement outcome half of the time. So, so this is the uh, challenges. So let me talk about how do we uh, accomplish, how do we, uh, our, our strategy to overcome these challenges. Uh, okay, so the first thing is of course that we generalize this thing to handle sampling problems. This step is just by composing several known techniques. So there is, uh, so I just defer the details to our paper. I encourage you to read it if, if, if you find it interesting. But then the actual fun part is a part that is on the right. So uh, of course the, uh, as you, okay. So the thing is that, so on Hadamard round, it would, everything works as expected. You get a measurement outcome, then you just feed the measurement outcome back to this protocol and output whatever it outputs, everything works out. But in the testing round, you don't get a measurement result. So the natural solution here, or at least one natural solution here, is to just run this protocol in parallel, run many copies of it. Then maybe one copy would have a Hadamard round and you'll be able to get your measurement result that way. And that is basically close to what we did. What we did is actually, uh, we just need a single Hadamard round. Everything else is testing. Because uh, because we only need the uh, we only need one measurement output. Having more will not help. So this is actually a can choose protocol where we just choose a random. We just run many copies of this protocol in parallel and choose a random copy to get the measurement outcome, and we just do testing on on all other ones. And that is basically so. The construction is also some is also quite natural, but the challenging part is to analyze this protocol. Because now if you are running many copies of a protocol at the same time, then the prover could choose some entangled strategies between those copies. So we follow this work that I also mentioned earlier. So we decompose the prover's internal state between the second and third message 
based on which uh, based on which testing run will will the prover gets uh, rejected. Basically, based on where the prover gets rejected and accepted. And the analysis, as you might see, gets uh, gets somehow gets quite involved. So I also defer to the uh, I defer the technical details again to our paper. But another remark I want to make is that uh, while this while this work allows us to use it as a starting point to decompose the state, the, uh, there are also two issues. Issue number one is that, well, the way that we uh, do the construction is a bit different because we are choosing only one Hadamard round, so the decomposition has to be changed. And also we need to make the analysis a bit more sophisticated because this work was on decision problems, so we only had to reason about decision, uh, uh, only had to reason about acceptance probabilities, but now we need to reason about distribution being closed, be, being close to each other. So there's just quite a bit to, uh, quite a bit we need to add to this work. So lastly, about blindness. So for to achieve blindness, we actually construct a generic blindness protocol compiler. What I mean is that uh, we can apply our compiler to the protocol from a previous slide to achieve blindness. Uh, but not only that, but this compiler works on any of the earlier works that I mentioned in the same line of literature. We can just apply our compiler to any of those protocols and also make them blind. And the high level idea is to just run the protocol under FHE, under full homomorphic encryption. But the, uh, and of course there are some issues, uh, some technical issues if you try to do that. Well, to start with, you probably want to use one of these two uh, schemes, either one by Barkowski or the one by Mahatev. It's a separate paper from the one from earlier, but you basically need the scheme to be compatible with the setting. And even so, there will still be some technical loose ends that you need to tie up. So again, for the uh, technical details, I refer to our paper. So that is basically our uh, technical overview. And lastly, about the future directions. So there are two questions that we want to ask. The first question is, of course, the uh, inverse poly error we had earlier. Can we make the error negligible? And we don't know. We have some, uh, some starting points, but we don't know if the starting points work. Specifically, we know that negligible error is achieved in related settings. So for example, in verifiable quantum for homomorphic encryptions or in multi-party computations, multi-party quantum computations. But in those settings, currently, uh, current constructions would all require the client or I guess the parties to have at least some weak quantum capabilities to store qubits and so on. So that's the first question. And the second question is if we can construct a more general remote state preparation protocol. So what I mean here is that currently the remote state preparation protocol only allows you to prepare, maybe choose from a finite subset of maybe 10 different states. So we are wondering if we can generalize our result to also, uh, so right now we have a classical output that is received by the client, but maybe we could also allow quantum output that is received by the server. In that case, there will be remote state preparation, and maybe we can prepare arbitrary states instead of just choosing from a finite state of 10 states. And that is all I have. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. All right, thanks for the talk. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions. Uh, as a reminder, uh, please come to the microphone uh, so everyone online can hear. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, just very small question. You mentioned uh, quantum uh, LWE. Uh, yes. Is is there a difference between the quantum version of this assumption and the normal LWE assumption? Uh, I think it's, it's just the same thing. So Q of W is just the uh, learning of error is hard for quantum for quantum computers to solve. Right. So it's more like some quantum access to the problem instance itself. Uh, uh, for LWE, the instance is just a matrix and a vector, right? So it's more like on, those, uh, on, on the input of that matrix and vector, you have a quantum algorithm trying to find the, uh, trying to solve the soft that linear equation like AX equals to Y or something. Okay, okay. Plus error. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, I mean, it's, the, the input is classical. So there's, there's no Oracle or something like that. So I'm not sure what you mean by quantum access. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, so I had a, a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, the difference between statistical error and uh, computational indistinguishability. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious if you could say a little bit more about what the barriers are. Like, for example, if we removed the blindness uh, requirement, can you get statistical or are there still barriers? Uh, unfortunately, we don't know because, uh, okay, so Mahatev's work, uh, as in the first one on verifiability, that thing already based is based on LWE. So basically the entire line of literature is based on LWE. And so the first part is that, and the spinous compiler, which is, you know, a more standalone component, but that thing is homomorphic encryption, also LWE based. So it's really unclear. All right, thanks. All right, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker. Um.